I'm Mary Spur. Um, I am a uh, graduate of the GW Sustainable Lands, taking, uh, had already taken classes in landscape design and finished the uh, first part of the program, just a regular design certificate, when the sustainable program came along. And so I stuck around and finished that off with the master's in 2009. I think the details of things appeal to me. There is some analysis involved with things when you go out to a site and try to figure out what's going on. So that and a long time love for drawing and being outside and spending the greater part of my career locked behind vault doors and places with no windows, I jumped at the chance to do something different in the second part of my life. So here I am. You're harvesting the wind, harvesting the sun, I'm harvesting from the land and where the landscape comes in and the whole kind of outdoor um, living and kind of healing and therapeutic environment where you actually have a connection to the outside. You're not living in a house, you're living in an environment and a home. Um, the whole thing really was, you know, the therapeutic part of it and the connection uh, was to ultimately um, have this house go to a wounded veteran um, coming back from Iraq or, or Afghanistan. And it's kind of nice to put the effort in um, to honor and to give to someone who sacrificed so much. What we tried to do here with the whole um, idea of the connection and harvesting was that you have the occupant of the home who is connected to the ground, they're connected to the landscape in the home, but also these edible gardens provide them the harvest, but also gives them a connection through the permaculture that we've tried to do in our selection of edibles and herbs, as well as native plants that bring in pollinators. Um, the, uh, the permaculture, which technically stands for permanent agriculture, is more than just plunking in annual vegetables in the ground, but it's a mix of pollinators, it's a mix of the composting, it's a mix of bringing in native plants and a mixture of the plants that sustain us that we actually eat. And it's basically putting together a collection of plants and things in the soil that make it a lot easier to do the gardening because you're not constantly fighting it. It actually is doing the work for you. We have a lot of pollinators that have been busy in here um, and they're brought in by the native plants that pull them in. To see them out here working almost from sun up to sundown is pretty fascinating. Um, and it all just works together. So you're not working as hard. Hopefully all you have to do is kind of guide it, set things in motion, and you're kind of mimicking the natural processes that we've so cut ourselves off from in our general landscapes. And just to come out here and look at the bumblebees and to feel that connection to everything, it kind of feels lonely when the pollinators aren't here, but when they're around, it's almost like you have friends. They're just buzzing and things are alive. They're moving, you can hear them, so it's it's kind of a multi-sensory thing. Also, what we focused a lot on with this garden was trying to experiment in this pop-up milk crate environment was to use a combination of your strict edibles and things people think of like tomatoes, eggplants, melons, but also working in a lot of the companion plants, which is another big part of permaculture where you have plants that either bring in the good bugs or they draw up nutrients from the soil that those fruiting plants need. When you look at some of the vignettes through the garden, and we've kind of tried to do that and picture it together, is, is you get a lot of nice texture coming out of them as well as flowers. So it's just kind of a nice thing as opposed to having straight rows of tomatoes. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. Um, and I mentioned comfrey. Um, kind of has a horseradish look to me, but it's a really beautiful bright green, very bristly leaves. But when you look at this compared to the really fine texture of the dill and then sage, and you see some of the color behind it with the marigolds and just with your regular standard tomato and pepper plants right around it. Another cluster that was kind of nice at its peak with the garlic chives and lemon balm, which is a companion plant in terms of beneficial insects, but also can be used as a tea, and the sweet potato vine. So it's just playing around with color and texture, which is a part of it. They're all green, but it's very vibrant and very alive and tactile. So. Um, that's kind of what we try to achieve um, with the permaculture, with the multi-purpose, that everything is, it's, it's beautiful, it's edible, it's sustainable, and it just, it keeps it alive. Part of the challenge with this, um, trying to set it up in DC, was to try to troubleshoot some of the things we might run into on the California side of things. And uh, the biggest challenge for us, um, once we lined the milk crates with the geotextile fabric, which allows infiltration, while also holding the growth medium, was that um, we didn't want to hold too much water or lose too much water because on the for the competition, there's a quota of water. And you're trying to strike a balance between um, getting enough water for the plants and having it drain through so quickly that you're using more than the quota that the house has. So we 
experimented around, did some research, and tested out some ways to come up with a soil mix um, that did two things basically, was retain enough water but not too much, and keeping it well drained but hydrated enough for the fruiting and flowering um, edibles. Uh, but also coming up with a mix that was not quite standard um, in terms of soil mix for gardens. And so what we did was come up with a mixture of garden soil, um, one, third one part garden soil, one part compost, part compost and one part um, coconut fiber, which comes in bales or little bricks basically and you rehydrate them. And so that keeps the, the soil having some structure. So it allows drainage, but also retains a lot of moisture. And unlike peat, when it gets dried out, it, it's not hydrophilic, so the water doesn't just sheet off of it. So it's kind of a nice mixture. And even now, when you dig your hands down into it after a few days of not watering, it's nice and moist in the middle, but not too wet. There is a grade over here that hasn't been planted yet. Um, you're lucky to get some pretty decent garden soil to begin with. Um, it's kind of a nice loam. Um, with a good mix of organic matter and garden soil and the coconut fiber, which you can barely see, kind of, I can show you. Yeah, where is it? A pile of it that hasn't been mixed in. That's what the coconut fiber looks like. Um, it's kind of a reddish, reddish brown. This we actually mixed in some extra vermiculite and perlite again for water retention and soil structure purposes but it's kind of a dark brown and the other side of this pile where you can see the interface with the garden soil where you kind of start getting the regular and you can see the difference. We basically just filled up uh, five gallon buckets with a three part mixture and that's what we came up with for the mix and it's been working well here and this particular soil recipe has been um, conveyed to the growers out west who are working on the edibles as we speak and I think they're beginning to plant those crates for us. Um, the only difference is here we don't have contract growers because when the decision was made that we're going to put a kind of a trial garden here, um, I started a mix of seeds in my apartment. I had some plants that I ordered, things that were very slow from seed that never would have been mature for the, the uh, display phase here, like eggplants and tomatoes. So um, that's the only real difference, but also finding the vegetables we would commonly grow here during the summer as opposed to what we would find in California in the fall which is when they're gonna be planting there. There are some commonalities we have, um, such as the artichoke, which they're gonna have, although they're not quite as grand as they probably could be. They got a little slow start because of being in my apartment, but that's the same. So it's nice to see, yes, they can survive and we'll be thriving out there. Um, and the tomatoes also, I believe, will be out there, but what we won't see out west are things like squashes and things like that. It's, it's much more to, suited to their climate for October. So the plant materials are different, but the soil mix will be the same. The method for putting the crates together will be the same. And uh, in, addition, in addition to the soil, one thing we did and we found out here was by putting a thin tray of foil in the bottom. We could also help some of the, you're gonna lose some water on the, so, on the sides of the mill crate through that fabric, but at least it keeps some of it that might trickle through on the bottom so the plants can wick it up. And I would say that one thing we're going to do, and hopefully we have one here, is uh, one of our, faculty advisors came up with this invention for a self-watering infiltration thing to further conserve water, which these are going to be shipped out to the contract grower as they fill up these milk crates so we don't have to retrofit them. But these will go to sit down, and this is a bulb crate, but it'll sit down in the milk crate, the soil around it, the plants will go in, and basically we will fill up these with our quota of water for the most water thirsty edibles. And instead of just having it lost to, to um, running through the geotextile or splashing, the water will be held in this reservoir and then whipped up by the plant roots through this washcloth um, in the perforated holes. So this will be inserted in anywhere from 20 to 50 of the milk crates out west for things that would need a lot of water. This was uh, an invention of, like I said, one of our advisors to try to use every drop of water we could and maximize what's going to the plant roots as opposed to losing it to evapotranspiration or just waste out the side. So we're gonna test out one of these in the unplanted crate just to see how it works. And um, we'll see. So this is kind of an ingenious thing. It's indoor-outdoor living. The outdoor is a perfect extension of the inside. There's something to benefit from anywhere around that home to help them kind of feel connected again, to find a place to feel grounded. Um, and to get back to uh, some degree of normalcy. I've had the benefit over the course of 22 years working with soldiers and sailors from every branch of the service. And 
you retire, but you're always part of that. And I think it just makes it that much more meaningful for me.